Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am interviewing Sarah Oberly. Sarah is a doctoral student, a teacher and a doctoral student at the University of Delaware. And in this episode we're going to unpick memory and cognitive science and see where the conversation takes us. So Sarah, thank you for joining me. How it's are a you? Pleasure. Um, now, oh, just for context for listeners, um, we were just having a quick conversation before we pressed the record button. Um, we, uh, I was writing a book on memory, you were doing a literature review on working memory, and we connected about, gosh, four months ago or so, maybe around that time. Oh, gosh. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, and uh, you, you were kind enough to send some super detailed feedback uh, on my books. We'll talk about that in a bit, but I want to talk about... Um, your literature review on working memory, I suppose, and then we'll we'll go through my usual questions on the podcast and we'll unpick who you are and things like sure. that. But uh, tell me, uh, I guess, how we came to be and what you were working on at the time. Is, is the paper published now? Um, no, so it's not meant for publishing, although, you know, I would love for that to happen. Um, I teach first grade, so... Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have grades in the UK, but for us, that's six and seven year olds. Yeah, no, we call um, them year and, year groups. Okay. So, so six so and seven year olds would be, would be like year two. Yeah, year two, year one, year, year two, one about year that two. time. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and you know, just in my practice, I've been doing it for. I just finished my fourteenth year. Um, I see a lot of issues with. Um, just processing breakdowns, which for the little ones just looks like, you know, they shut down or they cry or they just yeah. look at you exasperated and say, I don't know. Um, and as I started to learn about memory, I thought, gosh, how much of this is just that working memory breakdown? Um, and I thought if teachers would, would know about this and be able to identify it, um, perhaps we wouldn't have so many kids who are being labeled as lazy or, you know, ADD, um, you know, unmotivated. So I really wanted to study working memory as it pertains to practice. Um, so what I did yeah. was I created a document that just kind of explains in teacher friendly language, it's not super mm -hmm. technical, um, what working memory is, um, and what it's not as well. And what it looks mm -hmm. like when it's sort of um, going awry, particularly in the classroom. Yeah, what well, the problem we have here in England at the moment is a lot of inspectors for school inspections will go into classrooms or talk to pupils in groups. Uh, we have a kind of one size fits all inspection process for our schools. So there's very little variation for if you work with grade one or, or grade six, I should say, sorry, or year six, uh, year twos and sixes. And part of my sentiment analysis, we're looking at Ofsted, which is our inspection system here in the UK, uh, England, is looking at where working memory is used as a phrase when inspectors talk to pupils. And for me, all the dots are connecting because, you know, thinking about your literature review and what working memory looks like in a five-year-old compared to a 16-year-old is going to be very different, isn't it? Um, could I ask, uh, is it too early to kind of draw upon any conclusions from your research so far? Um, you know, I wouldn't say there's particular conclusions. I would just say that I think that maybe it sounds like even where you are, it's perhaps thrown around the terms working memory. Um, and I know for me over the years, I've seen people say, well, is it a working memory problem? But I don't know that we ever really knew what it truly was, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not short-term memory, it's not attention. Um, so I think just giving teachers the tools to understand how to identify, not diagnose, right? Because we're not diagnosticians, mm -hmm. but to be able to say, here's what I think is going on here. And then here's what I can do to support my students rather than just saying, you know, I think they have a problem with working memory. It's like, okay, well, what do we do sure. with that? Is that true? And then what do we do? How do we help our students? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and a lot of it, I will say a lot of the supports are things that, that we're already doing well, a lot of, and, and it, but it's more trial and error versus something mm -hmm. that's purposeful because you're identifying and recognizing that this is a specific issue. Um, so, 
Yeah, I think it's just, you know, I think the teachers maybe get a little put off by the science behind it, which mm -hmm. is why I felt like there was a need to just break it down. Yeah, you and mentioned make that. More applicable you know, to classroom practice. There's a big, big explosion with academic research for teachers. I guess it's making it, sh making sure it's accessible and teacher friendly language um, is is an essential. Um, just one more question on the subject, and I'd like to return to it actually. Um, I guess a, a hallmark of a child suffering from working memory would be, uh, I don't know, confusion, uh, not completing the task, opting out. Is that the type of things that you see in, in uh, your, your kind of context of research? Yeah, so um, things like, you know, having trouble initiating a task mm -hmm. or doing it incorrectly because you, you just cannot remember the directions or you can't remember them sequentially um, frustration or just it looking like an attention because there's just your your working memory capacity is just totally maxed and you know as as adults when we get frustrated we, we kind of just let go of everything anyway so as, as little kids you can imagine you know tears or putting their head down a absolutely or, I mean you know, today they... I, I had a bad night's sleep last night actually so um trying to process a couple of tasks today, I was finding quite challenging. And uh, right. I said, no wonder I'm finding it hard. Having have just written a book on memory and studied a bit of sleep. Uh, that <laughs> cognition and processing, uh, it's really important for right. us to recognize the signals, isn't it? Right. And I would say specifically, you know, for my students, what it looks like is when they are learning to read and they're having trouble segmenting sounds into a word by the time, mm -hmm. even if it's a three sound word, by the time they get to that last sound, They've forgotten what was Absolutely. that first sound that I made. So their blending falls apart. The reading falls apart. Um, math word problems are just such a challenge. It's just too much to maintain in working memory. Now, I, I want to come back to this, but I'm going to move on. So the first question I normally pose is uh, tell us about yourself, your career in teaching and, you know, who inspired you. And then we'll come back to your doctoral research. Um, so um, how did you become okay. a teacher? How did you become a teacher, first of all? Oh, um, well, I was listening to one of your other podcasts the other day and I was I was, it was so refreshing. One of your guests was just being completely honest. And he was like, I just became a teacher because I forget what he said, but it was just, it was refreshing to hear him be honest. So I will share that. Yes. Um, I went to undergrad for psychology and I ended up in marketing for a finance company. Right. And I just found it to be lucrative, but it just, um, I had no passion for it. Nothing felt good about it. And I thought, well, I'll be a teacher. That sounds really safe and it sounds cute, um, you know, and it's a lifelong career. So I'll yeah. do that. Um, so I went back to school. I got a master's um, in elementary education. And, you know, I just I had no idea how personally um, gratifying, challenging, yeah. yes. um, what a rewarding experience it would be and how much I would end up really loving it um so i'm thankful to say that i'm not just doing it because it's a yeah career. i mean for, I really 14 14 years is a good good stint so far uh, how many years did you last in marketing um that was about four okay um so yeah you're on the yeah. good side you, you know moved away from the dark side you're now right. in, in the right side of things Correct. okay that that's great um uh, another question i'd like to ask is what describe your 16 year old self what were you like at school yourself um 16 um i was a really good student um really active in clubs and i was a cheerleader mm -hmm. but i will say that you know it wasn't really cool to be nerdy yeah and so i tried desperately to hide my inner nerd um, i think i think it's coming really, back though isn't it it's know, coming back to be my, nerdy you know it is my husband will say this is your midlife crisis because i'm just i don't care i want to be me and i'm not going to apologize for it i'm not going to hide it so but at 16 you know, I just wanted to be accepted. I didn't want to be labeled as strange. So I would be, you know, in my bedroom reading about black holes or sonic boom or psychology textbook. But 
uh, you know, in, in social settings, I, I mm -hmm. certainly didn't want to be seen that way. So I'm very much going back and, and embracing that inner nerd and, and, and letting right, it be right. known now. Um, I'm true to myself. So obviously, uh, somewhere along the line, you know, the college conversation happened. And then, you know, what what got you into marketing? Originally? Well, I was a psychology major. Okay. Um, and, you know, to be totally honest, I had it all together until college and college, I just kind of felt like I'm just going to graduate and get a job. Um, and so that was really the first thing that came up and I took it and it paid well and I was working in New York City and I thought you know this is great I've got this great life but it just um it didn't Soulless. do it for me at all <laughs> yeah well yeah. that's um yeah um, exactly it was very cutthroat well um you know it's a very interesting story but you know the 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 you know geek is chic and that type of stuff uh, uh you know the the field of cognitive science and psychology you know it, it's something i've been interested in since i was a very young man you know 18 years old or something but i never you know specialized in it uh always really interested didn't you know didn't necessarily have the rigor of writing you know you, you don't really as a young person how, how to write lit reviews and uh what all these very complicated brain terms mean but you know you've got you've got my book and you've seen what i've done recently that's my own journey um how how have you kind of navigated your you know you did a psychology major which is a big deal um and obviously you've come full circle now so um how i can see what you're doing with your literature reviews i'm trying to think what the question is here is how is psychology here's the question informing you to become a better teacher is what i'm interested in um, I would say psychology more so has been relative for me with colleagues, mm -hmm. um, and sort of building relationships, understanding when people are perhaps defensive, they don't want to hear new ideas or, um, you know, curious, but perhaps threatened, but more so, you know, I would say years and years of being a classroom teacher, I, you're, you're doing all these things in your classroom and then you read an article and they're talking about it and how they've spent five years studying it. And you're thinking, this is going on in my classroom every day. Yeah. And it's going on in my, my colleagues and we didn't need anybody to spend a million dollars on research for it. So I think also approaching academics mm -hmm. with this topic I've had to use a little bit of psychology and, you know, I don't want to make anyone feel defensive. I don't want to make anyone feel, um, you know, threatened. So I've definitely been up against some adversity in terms of the academics are kind of like, you know, you don't belong with us. And the practitioners are kind of like, what are you doing? Why are you going over there? So I'm sort of on this island in between research and practice right now. And I'm yeah. trying to be friends with both if you will. Um, yeah, I know. But... And I guess that's where the, the, the ed doctorate comes in, right? It, it's that balance between the academic and the practitioner side, isn't it? Correct. Um, so I think that what led me to start my doctorate was just the frustration with the bureaucracy in education and being in front of my students day after day and knowing what was best for them but you know in certain situations my hands are tied because i have mm -hmm. to teach this or i have to do that or you know I'm, things are prioritized that seem to misalign with what our purpose is mm -hmm. which is teaching our students right and nurturing them and and instilling a love of learning um and you know nobody wants to listen to a first grade teacher so i thought okay fine then i will go and you know do what i have to do and get the credentials that i need and perhaps along the way someone will want to hear what i have to say but um the cognitive science piece is really me saying i want to have the knowledge now in addition to having the practical experience because i think mm -hmm. i think you need both and I think the dichotomy just is so strong in you're either here, you're a practitioner, or you're a researcher. Um, yeah, and, and there's so, not much scope for in know, between, is there? And I think the, the doctorate gives us, a, a you know, this, I, I'm still teaching kind of part-time, full-time. I want to think like a researcher. I know that when I tell a child off in class, 
it does do something so I need to try and evidence it in a practitioner sense and that's the battle I've had with my doctoral degree um, also uh, Sarah a quick question can I um, have you always worked in the same school or have you moved to different schools I have been in the same school in the same classroom <laughs> for all 14 years I feel all right, very brilliant. lucky that um, yeah, I, th yeah. I think if you can find that so, and you're happy and you can thrive um, and you're still top of your game and you're making a difference, uh, a lot of teachers get quite shy about being in one place for so long, but I, I think it's something worth celebrating. I, you know, I feel fortunate that I'm in a position where I'm happy with what I do, I'm happy where I am, and so I'm not in a rush to finish school and get out. Um, on the contrary, I'm just settling in and enjoying the journey because I can't imagine leaving the classroom in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I can take opportunities that come along if I want to, but I don't have to take anything because I'm, I'm perp perfectly fine staying in the classroom. Right. Now, um, um, I'm sure yeah. what gets in the way is your doctoral research and it's a headache and it's a work burden uh, also. And I know you've got a family. Um, uh, tell, tell us a little bit more about your doctoral studies. So when did you start? A, a bit about the program at the University of Delaware. Um, how much time you dedicate to it? Just, it just gives a whole overview of uh, your journey so far. Um, I would love to say that, you know, it's just all been easy, but it certainly has not. Um, I started um, a year ago. I'm a year in, so I'm halfway through, and it's an ED program. So I'm halfway through my ED classes. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, for me, it's it's the the passion that has has sort of fueled my motivation to work. But I would say, you know, also there's a selfish piece that it's the personal growth too. It's the mm -hmm. you know, 16 year old nerd that is like, gosh, I wish I could I could go back and pursue those interests that I was too, you know, embarrassed to pursue that now I'm like, you know, I'm just going to do it now. Um, so it's been, it's been challenging. I work full time. Yeah. Um, so I'm five days a week. I'm at school until, you know, 430 in the afternoon. And then um, I have class on Zoom or I have class in person. I have, you know, papers and studies yeah. and all kinds of things. <laughs> I have two kids who are also um, in elementary school and primary school as well. So thankfully, my husband has been very supportive. Um, he owes me because he was in school for about eight years prior to this. So he wow, knows there it's you his go. turn. So you're pulling, you're um, pulling in the cards now. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it is, you know, as a parent, it, it does feel sometimes, you know, it, am I, am yeah, I um, being selfish and, and I should be using this time for my children, right? But I want them to see this example of, you know, continue yeah, good for you. learning and I mean, doing, growth, a, doing a doctorate's so. doing a doctorate's hard work, full stop, doing it with a, a young children, you know, full time job, uh, you know, like you said, in the classroom, that that is really hard. Um, so uh, the question is, um, how do you fit? Where do you fit in the time? How regular? You know, I, I find it a struggle. Um, but how, what, how, what what techniques are you using to kind of fit it in? Um, well, I am using a lot of the techniques that I've been learning about, to tell you the truth. So what I'm learning about memory, what I'm learning about retrieval. What's been really nice is as I learn about them, I can not only apply them with my students, but I'm applying them to myself. Um, right. So, um, you know, things like studying for a little bit and then walking away or going to bed and kind of letting it settle in while I'm sleeping. Yeah. Um, but in terms of just actual logistics, I'm doing it, you know, after my kids go to bed, um, early in the morning, on the weekends. Um, if I have to leave and go to the library, if my husband's around, I will, or if I have mm -hmm. to get a sitter. So, um, it's definitely it's challenging but i try to do it i try to not do it when i'm with my children but i would be lying if i said that yeah of i course. never do it with my but kids I, especially I like what being you home said. all summer with them sure i like what you said you, you know you know the, the research and insights you're gathering you're applying to your own life because you know when we talk about memory and retrieval uh, it works for us all it doesn't matter how old you are and how experienced you are um, so it's really interesting that you, you know, you walk away, you go to bed, 
because you know that you either you know that work in memory where information suffers and it's lost um i guess that's where you can really benefit from those insights and apply them absolutely and i and i feel it and i've had some classes where the content is completely new to me i mm -hmm. mean the real technical science classes and i'm walking in taking a doctoral level cognitive science class with no true academic history mm -hmm. and just feeling so over my head. And I'm like, this is how my students feel when they're, you know, having a meltdown. Sure. Um, and, you know, the, sen the sensation that I have nothing to anchor this new learning to. I don't know where to put it. Yeah. I have nothing to relate it to. Um, so it definitely has given me compassion for my students, but it's also kind of helped me in terms of seeing how once I have a little bit of foundation and I struggle through that initial learning, everything else kind of can grasp, has something to grasp onto. Sure. Um, I remember so, um, you know, when, I, it, when I first tackled social media network analysis using R stats and Node, and uh, the first time I think it took me four or five hours, but now I can do it in about 10 minutes, but <laughs> it just shows you that practice. Could you... Um, could you give us a, a kind of overview of some of the topics you've been covering and what were those things that were really difficult in the beginning that you've had to categorize and uh, use relevant information to retrieve? Uh, what kind of things have you been studying? Um, so I have studied um, policy, so educational policy, which for me is not as exciting because I tend to be more attracted to the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, I have done, um, let's see, um, educational technology. I've done um, technology and cognition. I've had leadership classes. I've had um, data collection and analysis, which was a qualitative yeah. um, data collection analysis course. So I had to interview administrators and then code the interviews, right, which okay, I right. now know I never, ever want to have that as my <laughs> career. You yeah. know, I will say one thing, these classes kind of, they're, it's process of elimination because some things I'm like, I now I know for sure I never want to do this, yeah. right? Um, so what's kind of happened through the classes and through the process, I, I came in wanting to work on, really wanting to work on educational neuroscience. And as I progressed, I've learned that that's way too narrow, right? Um, mm -hmm. And unless I want to quit and get a PhD, I, I really don't have enough time to devote to studying that as it should be studied. So I said, okay, cognitive science kind of encompasses much more of, of that field and, and that knowledge, and, and I can tackle that. Um, so um, what I'm working on now is the knowledge itself, the research itself, in terms of learning sciences and how it supports practitioners. But in addition to the research itself, I've also been working on how to disseminate that information to classroom teachers, mm. because they do not want to sit down and read a research article. No, um, And I completely <laughs> understand why. Um, they do not want a professional development session from a cognitive scientist, right? Because we don't speak the same language. So in addition to trying to take the research from learning sciences and translate it into something that's usable, understandable, and not to undermine educators' intelligence at all. Um, it's just, you know, the terminology, if you're not familiar with it, it can, mm -hmm. it can be really hard to understand in the statistics. Um, so translating that research for practitioners, but also looking at why is there such a divide? Why is there such a divide between the researchers and the people in the classrooms? Yeah, it's um, frustrating, isn't it? All the and, time I ask the same question, you know, this, you know, the, the PhD is that kind of complex theory and language and, you know, very complicated terminology that's, you know, taken the world a bit further, but for you know, where, particularly where educational research wants to make a big difference for the classroom, you know, teachers like you, you don't have a lot of time. You've got 30 kids around you all day, every day. Uh, you don't have time to read a 30 page paper and learn new terminology, which makes no difference to your professional practice. And it, it does the opposite, which the research 
hopes. I've got a couple of kind of thoughts, I suppose, Sarah. Um, one, um, it, 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 would I be wrong to assume that the first kind of year or two of your doctoral studies is kind of an overview of anything and everything to learn, to help you understand where you want to sit with your research? Yes. So the way my EdD program works, there are core classes that everyone has to take. And they, mm -hmm. they're, the program is an educational leadership course. Um, I don't have much interest in ed leadership in the traditional sense. I'm not trying to be a school administrator or a district yeah. administrator. Um, but, you know, I have to take courses that, that involve those skills and that knowledge. My concentration, cognitive science, is where my electives come in. Mm -hmm. So when I was talking to you about being in a class where I knew nothing and I thought, oh, I know about the learning sciences, you know, but yeah, I, I really was not prepared for a doctoral level academic course in cognitive science where you're right. learning about the, the visual streams and, and, and just you know, domain general versus domain specific and modularity. Yes. I thought, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's heavy and, stuff. Isn't it? <laughs> so, so I'm taking the required course. Um, adding in these courses so that I can be well-versed in the sciences. The problem that I'm running into is that these cognitive sciences are not designed for educators. Mm -hmm. They're designed for cognitive scientists. Yes. So as I am participating in discussions with classmates, reading research articles, here I come and I'm like, so what? Okay, here's these findings that seem so, you know, uh, just granular. And, and I'm like, uh, you know, and I would say, well, what's the implication for this? What do we do with this? And you know, yes. they would just get so frustrated with me. Like, no, but that's um, a good question to ask because my supervisor, you know, I'd go away and come up with something fancy and things. And then because of that relationship, you can then, he then used to pose this simple question. So what? <laughs> and then I'd have to justify it all and come up with another uh, kind of additional theory or justification. And then he'd say, now what are you going to do? And it's uh, it's uh, it's good that you're already asking those questions one year into your your studies. The other question I had from what your original discussion about your doctoral program was, you said that cognitive educational neuroscience was quite narrow. I, I, forgive me, I think that's really broad, but maybe I'm entirely wrong. Um, could you just explain why the field of educational neuroscience is very narrow? Um, I guess, for, so from my perspective, it's just one piece of the puzzle, and it's so specific that I don't think um, going through an ED program and supplementing with certain courses mm -hmm. would give me the depth of knowledge that I would need to sure. consider myself, you know, a, an expert in educational neuroscience. Um so, you know, as fascinating as that is for me, what I've learned is there's just so many other aspects of the sciences that go into learning, um, but it's not just the, ne mm -hmm. the neurons, the dendrites, the connections, the synapses, it's, it's a lot more than that too. Mm -hmm. So um, while I would love to drop everything and just study that, right? Yes. Um, I'm trying to take a, a more global sure. so perspective I, I, I... here. So I'm starting to understand that, that a bit more because, you know, non -psycho I'm not, a, I still consider myself not a specialist in psychology or neuroscience at all. Um, and taking that step back to cognitive science, which is a bit more broader and it covers lots of different aspects to allow you to specialize, would then allow you, I suspect, as an expert to then tackle your eventual research. I hope that's correct. Um, going back to your original paper then, Sarah, at least... Is this a first paper that you've been practicing with, the, the one on working memory? Oh, no. So the literature review was actually for a class. It was for my a cognitive science class. Okay. Um, but I've done papers on um, studying locally the divide be between research and practice. Um, I've done projects on student agency um, mm -hmm. and learner variability. Um, so I've kind of had my hands on a lot of different things and it's just because I 
find something that interests me or someone's work that I appreciate yeah. and I just reach out to them and say, how can I get involved and how can I, you know, learn and, and help your, your mm -hmm. cause. Um, so. And can I ask how, class that I, how, how is yeah. your academic writing moving forward? You know, that, that ability to reference, to, uh, make the the right arguments and things like that. How, how is that journey? Because I, I'm still I still fall into the trap of being a blogger uh, uh, and a very uh, untidy writer to, to someone you know, or putting it into a book, which I think for me now is quite easy. But that academic stuff's all new to me. How how are you getting on with that process? Um, yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? And yeah. <laughs> and you want to say something because you you're like. How do I know this? Because I've done it for over a decade. That's how I know it. But no, we have to find, <laughs> you know, someone who's probably never done it before, but has certainly researched it and published an article to sort of back up um, pretty much everything that you're attesting to in your writing. So, mm -hmm. um, and I always feel like reading academic writing, the citations make it feel choppy. Um, you mm -hmm. know, the figures and tables, it, it's not, it's not, um, carefree reading for sure and it's certainly not carefree writing no um but you know i just kind of had to jump in head first and i'm for sure not there yet um i'm getting better but i i have a ways yeah. to go in terms of being proficient sure and and you know trying to narrow down that field of inquiry to a, a research question and you know i remember my original proposal was so broad and taking on the world that I would never ever have got close to completing anything of substance. Um, so on working memory in grade one students, and you mentioned working memory breakdown, is that where you think you're going to go deeper into research in the future for publication? Um, no, I don't tell? actually. Um, so I, I, I don't know how your experience has been, but for me being in this program, I just have learned that I don't know what to expect. And so I'm kind of open to wherever this journey takes me. But as of recently, um, I partnered with, or I was doing some consulting for, I shouldn't say I partnered with, but Digital mm -hmm. Promise, which is a nonprofit organization. Okay. Um, and they really, they take um, ed technology, practitioners and research, and they try to combine it all. It's all free resources um, for practitioners, so I've been working with them on a series of um, instructional lessons about learner variability, which um, relates a lot to equity, but it also relates a lot to the learning sciences because the four pillars of learner variability are cognition, background, social and emotional learning, and um, content knowledge. So really what it is is teaching your kids how they learn or your students mm. i should say how they learn um which even for my young students they are fascinated by understanding and becoming aware of um things like their attention things like yeah you know, now I, i'm gonna pick you home. up on those four points because i think listeners would find that quite interesting so uh, if i got those correctly the cognition the background the social emotional aspects of learning and content could you tell me more of those four step four stages or four things so those are considered four factors that affect us as learners um and digital promises message is to look at the whole child as far as, you know, a learner, as someone who we all come from different homes, different situations. Um, we have had different experiences that all affects our learning. Um, content knowledge, what we already know, what we've brought with us, that affects our learning. Our cognition, so things like memory, things like processing, um, decision making, understanding, um, and social emotional in terms of peer relationships, stereotype mm -hmm. threats, um, any any sort of health, sleep, yeah, sleep um, anything yeah. that, yeah, anything that can affect your, your, your state of mind. And, and so these four factors are really to teach educators about, hey, here's all the things that go into your students. Here's what you need to know. 
Mm -hmm. I then worked with them on how do we teach our students about this mm -hmm. to help them be more self-aware, but also to help them embrace their peers as differences are unique, differences are um, important, and they're to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. So that has really taken me on a, I started that in probably February, right. um, and I just presented on that at a state conference recently and there's been so much interest in in that yeah, i saw topic. you put a post so, on uh, your linkedin profile with a, a poster yeah. board i don't know if that was similar but that yes. was quite eye-catching and i guess the other qu critical part is yes teach your students a bit more about these things but what what could i do as a teacher if i knew a bit more about this and um, you mentioned earlier you know I'd, how to disseminate it i don't want all the complicated language and uh, you know, five period day, and then I've got to go to a CPD session on cognitive science. How, how could I, uh, the questions are, <laughs> um, how would it make me a better teacher? And how could we turn this information into a useful teacher training session? Um, so in my opinion, and I don't have any citations to give you on this, it's just my opinion. Opinion is good for um, now. But I always think <laughs> If, thank you. I always think if we're tasked with instilling a love of learning, with teaching our students content, um, and how to be critical thinkers, should we understand at some mm -hmm. basic level how that happens and what can cause that process to break down? I mean, I think it's like a mechanic who, who knows how to do these isolated tasks but doesn't understand how the car works, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, how yeah. is... Why do we not know these things? And I think there's a really fine line between what teachers want to know and what at what point will they say, nope, that's too much and completely disengage. Yes. So I think we have to find we have to find a way to share what's absolutely relevant without going overboard with the language or the science. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, I, I've been I've been there myself for years and years where you sit there and it's like, okay, is this how is this going to help me in my classroom? You know, like, Absolutely, don't waste my yeah. time. Yeah. So what I've been trying to do with all of my individual assignments projects in my classrooms is say, how can I take this topic and break it down to bare bones, most important concepts, forget the fancy academic language, Yes. What would I want as a classroom educator? What would be the easiest for me to understand? What would make me want to look at it? What would make me want to keep it? Um, and that's what I try to keep in mind with whatever I'm working with is, you know, the average uh, first grade teacher is not learning cognitive science, educational neuroscience, mm -hmm. psychology. And I don't blame them. Mm. I just happen to be super fascinated by it. Um, but I think that there's really important things to be shared. So finding that that sort of space where it's just enough mm -hmm. that they'll listen and they'll learn. Now, uh, as you were talking about, you mentioned the words break it down. Um, what, what recommendations? So if you did break all this, you know, your latest paper and you broke it down and it was a 20, 30 minute session for teachers. Uh, uh, any recommendations, you know, because this is this is part of my day to day work is looking at all this type of stuff and trying to turn it into useful teacher training sessions. And I, I've not I'm not mastered it yet, but I think I'm getting close. Uh, and you know, you've got a copy of my latest book. I haven't worked out what those slides look like or what the training looks like for that yet. And I need to get my finger out soon because I'm going to be delivering that in a couple of months to a couple of schools. But um, any recommendations, Sarah? What 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 would you say would be a great uh, training session for a, a group of teachers? Uh, if we go back to you know those four factors: the cognition, the seal, the content type stuff. What what would you recommend as a useful method? for a teacher training session. Um, and I did think that the book was excellent in terms of relevance and Thank you. practicality, <laughs> applicability to the classroom. Um, you know, I think that just keeping the content um, related to classroom practices, not getting too abstract or conceptual mm -hmm. and saying, here's what this might look like. Here's what you might see in a student or might not see in a student. Um, 
because if I have to start making those connections myself, uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't, right? Or I'll go sure. on and teach my students and, and forget all about it. Um, and also, okay, tell me also what I can do. So tell me what I'm looking for and tell me what I can do. And don't make it be, you know, go get a doctorate, right? Like give me some tangible takeaways that I can go in my classroom right now and say, you know what, you're visually distracted. Let me give you this, or let me give you a quiet space, or, you know, let me give you a voice recorder so that you don't, when you're developing your writing, you haven't, you don't forget your mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I want to see something that is not text heavy um, and that has classroom examples. And I think coming I think the delivery matters. You know, there's there's too many people who haven't done it and don't understand it and don't appreciate it enough giving these messages. And it's like, you know, you're so far removed from practice yes. Yes. that, you know, you could tell me all day long what I should be doing, but like, when's the last time you did it, right? So that just don't understand the nuances. So I think being upfront with saying, I know that you have so much to do. And I really want to make this a valuable use of your time. Here's how this is going to help you. Here's how this can improve your practice mm -hmm. and not make it complicated. Yeah, no, there's some great messages there. And, you know, for me now, you know, doing teachers, I'm five years in and I get very nervous about, you know, when last I was in a room full of kids and marking books. Um, but I did 25 years. I've got my stripes. I, I do think training teachers is a different uh, well, there there are some similarities. Obviously, adults have a lot more, uh, going back to your four factors, cognition, background, etc. They can balance their sleep and uh, their content, etc. But that the messages that I got from you there was that rather than abstract concepts, make it concrete. Here's an example. Um, I love the phrase tangible takeaways. Uh, I think, you know, the average reading time on my website is 70 seconds. That tells you all you need to know about teachers reading my website about how much time they have, what they're looking for, what's going to make a difference. And I think the the biggest one, right, Sarah, is um, can I use it in my classroom tomorrow? Um, so um, I, I, I could talk all day about this, but I've got to be conscious because there, there's probably people listening to our podcast and we're <laughs> I need to bring it back to kind of a, a, a structure. Now, normally my podcasts are about 30 minutes or so. We've gone well over the time. And I normally wrap things up with a kind of little quick fire question. Uh, look, I've written tons of notes. I've got so much information here. And actually, I've got lots of ideas I want to get in touch with you about, about some potential, uh, not giving you more work, but just some loads of kind of uh, some ideas. Um, right, let me go to my script, because this is what I'd like to just ask, I suppose, is... You know, you mentioned um, you've you've got your kind of psychology uh, interest. You're, you've you gone back to where your passion is the most, and you're you're blending your teaching uh, alongside your doctoral studies and the challenges associated with that. I guess some of the questions I want to pose now are kind of quick fire questions. So just try and see if I can catch you out, and without you pausing and hesitating, this would be a great example of working memory here. Um, so I'll start easy. Um, what, what are you working on? What project are you working on today? Oh, statistics. <laughs> right, good answer. I am, okay. <laughs> uh, I actually, you know what? Real quick, I am reviewing an article on working memory as a predictor of academic success. Ah. But I'm looking at the statistics of it. <laughs> right, really, really interesting. Um, what book are you reading? For fun, not for 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 geek and uh, chic. So, not specifically education related, but I think life related. Um, a book by Carol Tarvis called "Mistakes Were Made, But Not by Me." All right, it's interesting. About, um, cognitive. It's about cognitive dissonance and uh, and um, self justification. Oh yeah, I mean I've been there all my Twitter work and uh, arguing with lots of trolls. I I, <laughs> I came across cognitive dissonance a few years ago. It's an interesting topic. Okay, great. Finish this sentence. If I was Education Secretary of State, I would ask more practitioners for 
uh, input. Great, good tip. Um, what would be your piece of advice for a teacher wanting to get into the field of research and start a doctoral kind of program? What would be your top tip? Um, don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Okay, good tip. That, that kind of uh, cognitive dissonance on your shoulder. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, my next question is, um, now we, you've got a background in marketing, as you've discussed. You've got into teaching, which uh, you think you've found your, your thing. But um, dare I say, if you had uh, an off-the-wall wacky career that you've never tried, or dare I say it's cognitive science or something, what, what's that dream job you've not yet had? Um, probably being an astronomer. Okay, wow. Um, and <laughs> what is your biggest career achievement? Uh, I think it's yet to come. Um, I'd like to think so. Right, that's a nice but, answer. Okay, um, we've not had that one before. But... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we'll move on. I'll take that one. I like that one. Um, if we were, I haven't been to New York for a long time, gosh, a long time, 15 years or so. If we went to New York, what would we do? Where would we go? And we had 24 hours, oh, so what, you know, fit it into 24 hours, what would we do? To New York? Um, we would probably see a show, uh, for sure, just walk around and sightsee. There's so many great museums. Uh, just explore the culture. Okay, nice. Uh, and top tip for teaching grade one? You got to find the good in all of them. Okay, nice. Um, what's your advice to uh, researchers out there in terms of disseminating research for teachers? What, what would be your top recommendation? I would say come and ask us what we need and come and ask us what works for us. Okay, random question here. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Okay, um, where can listeners find out more about you and your work? Um, I'm on LinkedIn, and um, I recently joined Twitter out of peer pressure, but I have to be honest, <laughs> I, have not, I have not embraced it yet. Um, or you can email me. It's soberly at udell.edu. Okay, great. Well, I might tag you on Twitter and then cause a bit of a Twitter fuel okay. with loads of people. I'll say, follow Sarah, and then we'll see what happens to your Twitter skills. Okay. Um, my next question, um, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Oh, I've got a good one for you. Um, Jared Cooney Horvath. Have you heard that name oh, before? Yeah. Yes, I know Jared. Yes. I've not. I've read his books. I've not had a chance to catch up with him on the podcast. But um, so tell me why. Um, so I've been in touch with him uh, a couple of times throughout my doctoral journey, and most recently when I was in my cognitive science class and I had all the PhD students saying, "Why do you keep asking? You know what the point is to this?" And I emailed. <laughs> him and I said oh man I'm making people you know I'm irritating people with my questions and he said ah yes you know you're this is all part of it um because you Good. know I, I respect him because he's a former classroom teacher who yeah. went back to school basically out of aggravation um so he respects classroom practice but he also is an educational neuroscientist so he knows what he's talking about and I love the fact that he makes videos for practitioners so he's taking the the, right. the science and he's translating it and saying hey here's what this means for you he beat me too right. i told him i said oh i'd like to do that but you were right, right great <laughs> well i'll get in touch with jared and see if he can sp uh, spend a bit of time but I, I loved his books especially the stop talking start influencing that was a great one um yes. uh i did have another question let me just check my uh list of stuff i got a, a an easy one and a big one what was your favorite memory uh, from school in terms um, of, if I could pick on that maybe a favorite teacher be more specific uh, I, I had I had a, a sort of a um, unusual childhood and I had a lot of teachers particularly when I was young that really knew that and took me under their wing and encouraged me and um, advocated for me so uh, I I I don't know that I could pick one, but I right, think okay, that, we that, won't. We'll say thank yeah, you to them yeah, all. Right, I've correct. got a self-indulgent question, so please forgive me. But what's your takeaway from Guide to Memory so far? 
Oh, um, that there is a way to communicate complicated technical science concepts that, that can be meaningful for right, educators. Right, great. I, I take that as a big accolade. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I love the QR codes. All right, great. <laughs> I'm pleased with that. Um, the QR codes are back in fashion, you know. <laughs> um, I know. What, um, last question, Sarah. Um, what do you hope to be your legacy? Um, I would like to be someone who breaks down some of those walls that are that are up right now. I think, you know, people talk about bridging the gap, whether it's bridging the gap or breaking down walls. I would like to be someone who's a bit of a hybrid professional who can appeal to practitioners because I have the experience and I know mm -hmm. the needs, but is also well versed in the research and can be respected by the researchers as well. So there you go. Now, Sarah, I, um, no offense to your marketing background, but I've had a great time on picking your cognitive science journey in your classroom practice. <laughs> I don't think I'd get excited about the marketing stuff. I mean, yeah. Part of my blogger's life is I have to get into a bit of marketing here or there. But yeah, it doesn't it doesn't float my boat as much as this conversation. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, well, my pleasure. And anytime you want to chat about, um, yeah, well, I'm know, definitely going to come back to you. And education. <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to come back to you. I wonder if we can maybe do a little event for listeners and maybe share some uh, tips for doctoral research, but also this, these four factors on the whole child. And, you know, when you quiz a kid or an inspector does and then writes about it, it's only one uh, called right. kind of small footprint on actually what's happening in the classroom that observers don't often see. But I'm going to wrap things up, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah Oberly, doctoral student, University of Delaware, grade one teacher, working really hard on the front line five days a week and getting through her research. And uh, look forward to seeing you publish more papers. Uh, and it'll be interesting to share uh, the doctoral headaches and the joys uh, as we connect <laughs> over the, the months to come. But thank you, Sarah, so much for your time. Absolutely. You're very welcome. <laughs>